Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm happy to see that you are joining us today all over the world. Today, we join forces with APC to be able to bring to you the webinar on solvent selection in pharmaceutical crystallization process development. Dr. Marco Ukrainczyk. He is currently the senior scientist technical lead of the small molecule crystallization process development team at APC in Dublin. He has a PhD in phys physical chemistry and he is a mechanic, uh, uh, sorry, a chemical engineer. I'm sorry, Marco. Prior to joining APC, he has done his postdoc at SSSP Center in uh, uh, Ireland, uh, together with Technical University of Munich and Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany, uh, specializing in crystallization. As a chemical engineer and physical chemist, he combines computational and experimental techniques in his work, mainly focusing on thermodynamic and kinetic aspects of crystallization, as an efficient synergy for improved process design aimed to speed up the delivery of life-changing medicines. Marco, thank you very much for um, sharing with you uh, your knowledge and some case studies today. I am making you now a presenter and I think now you will be able to share your screen with everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for the, this opportunity to pre pre present here today. So I am Marco and coming from APC from Dublin. And um, just a minute to clean the screen here. So, so APC is a pharmaceutical company. It's an R&D company located here in Dublin. It's just a half an hour walk from Irish Seacoast and we'd love an office spaces just overlooking the Wicklow Mountains. So it's a very nice uh, place to work in. It's um, APC is involved in process development. So we, we are involved in reaction optimization, crystallization, then all the way uh, across uh, distillation, filtration and drying to formulation platforms. We are focused on both. Marco, yes. just one uh, second. We do not. I do not see your screen. Uh, it is. I am projecting it. Just a second. Let me see. Yes. You see now. now? Perfect. Okay. So we are focused as APC on both early stage and late stage development, and it is for both small molecules and large biomolecules. And here today, I, I like to present uh, a, a topic on the solvent selection. So it's our solvent selection platform, which is done together in partnership with Janssen. So it's a crystallization technology unit in uh, Birsa, Belgium, with uh, Roni Weidenschott and Alain Kolas. So I'm happy to present um, the case studies, which we work together. But before I go to the case studies, I, I would first like to introduce you to the topic, then present a little bit on the in silico predictive modeling, which is our integral part of um, our early development, crystallization development, yes. And I will also introduce you into the, the workflow, which combines in silico screen and smart experimentation. And then, as I said, I will demonstrate our workflow on two case studies. So it's, it's uh, two proprietary API molecules. One is an in interesting example of anti-solvent crystallization and another one of a cooling crystallization. So this is what I planned for today. So selecting an appropriate solvent, this is the cornerstone of a good crystallization development and the solvent system from which API is crystallized influences solubility just let me see if I can get the pointer. Yeah, so solubility, growth and nucleation kinetics, impurity rejection, polymorph control, solvation and oiling propensity and crystal morphology. So as you can see, it's very important to select the right solvent. But despite this importance of this choice, usually early development solvents are often chosen quickly with only the impact of product yield considered. 
and this can lead to uh, to problems or processability issues or for example purity issues in later phases either during the scale up or optimization phase or even when the when it comes to the manufacturing when the material is being de delivered to either clinic or market so our development developed solvent selection platform is based on evaluating 12 criteria so we are going all the way from uh, yield productivity suitability so all these criteria which are still, uh, pointed here and also the solvent anti-solvent efficiency as well as uh, safety so it's uh, we are also considering safety and environmental choices so and we are doing that by using in silico predictive modeling and in the smart experimentation and i just want to maybe compare it with uh, other approaches which is for example more traditional and quite expensive and time consuming brute force approach so but we we are what i would like to claim here that we can do with our approach uh same or less time so we can reduce the early development time frames and also the risk regarding the time as i said less or same or less time than traditional brute force screening and regarding the risk i i, I believe that uh, the approach which i'm presenting today it dramatically it dramatically improves the likelihood of selecting a fit for purpose solvent for crystallization processes so we are basing our approach on quality by design principles and and here quality by design principle we are basing on in silico modeling so on this slide i would like to tell you more about it so in in the case of crystallization of course everything stands with the most important physical property which is the solubility and unlike in late stage crystallization development so we have it uh, here where accurate regression models are usually employed to map the full solubility design space so usually as a function of temperature solvent composition and also maybe pH based on time consuming experiments in the early phase so what we have here um, during the solvent screen those predictive models proved to be very extremely useful and important, especially for screening of large number of solvents and solvent mixture. So in this case, the accuracy compared to the empirical model is lower, but still satisfying to guide and narrow down the experimental work. As an example, here I'm showing the regressed Unifax, which is implemented in DynoChem. So the solubility prediction is possible based on provided molecular structure but also on experimental solubility data and some DSC data which are required as a minimum if we go even further to the first principle method so which are physics based all the way to molecular and electron scale so like for example quantum mechanical calculations so in this case i want to emphasize only molecular structure is required so as we can see, this makes them very powerful for early stage development, because usually in early stage, there is no data much available. And also the, the material, there is no, usually no sufficient material available yet. So the solubility and the solvent screen can be for, performed just ranking the solvent um, from, for example, from the potential very dissol dissolving solvents to anti-solvents as, as well as solvent mixtures here for this type of calculations I, at the moment i covered the solubility but i also wanted to emphasize if the molecular structure of impurities are provided so the solvents can also be screened for impurity purge without the need for example to have any impurities isolated for experimental work which we found in APC it's usually the case yeah it's we, we know the impurity structure, but very often we don't have um, standard materials of isolated impurities. I also would like to highlight that uh, we can also screen for uh, solvate propensity and co-crystal, as well as oiling propensity, and even going further, crystal shape and polymorphism. 
So, for example, if you have a unit cell, so crystallographic data, crystal shape, and also the polymorphic stability can be studied. So now when I introduce you to the methods which we are heavily using for the crystallization development, I, I would maybe like to go through the time now. So now in the different direction. So I would like to start uh, the way we are doing usually in, in APC. So we start first with a, um, early development. So it's the first principle methods because as I said, there is no or little material available. And, and there is no data. But once we generate and, uh, and select a solvent and we go to the lab and do uh, experiments, then once the solubility experiment and delta, uh, uh, data are generated, we then input that in the uh, Unifac models. So we are using this platform. And then generating even more data, experimental, experimental data, we are ending up uh, creating the full map which then is uh, used for the crystallization design. So uh, for, for, for the first principle models, I would like to introduce you what platform, platforms we are using. So first is quantum mechanical calculation. This is density functional theory uh, based calculations where solubility can be extracted based on uh, calculating the polarity profiles of uh, uh, APIs and also of solvents. And by creating and solving the electron density of API and solvent, they, this can be used to derive chemical potentials of API in a solution. So here, this is, uh, so from this, we can calculate relative solubilities. And it is, the calculation is based first, you can, you can uh, estimate the um, combinatorial part, which is the difference between size and shape between solvent and API. And also it calculates, if you look more from the statistical thermodynamics, it's this residual enthalpy, or it's actually the interaction contribution, which accounts for, for example, hydrogen bond, electrostatics, or Van der Waals interactions, which are introduced by inserting the API molecule inside the solvent. Also, solvent propensity can be calculated by calculating enthalpy of mixing. So this is now uh, based on the interactions, and it can be calculated as a difference between when you have a mixture of so solvent and API, and uh, the difference as a uh, only API and only only solvent. So this is the excess enthalpy of mixing. And for example, if you have a solvent where there is a high chance of hydrogen bonding, the interaction will be highly negative. Um, so, and this, this can be used for the, in, during the screening for the identification of potential unwanted solvates. As a second method we are also employing is the molecular dynamics. So this is now based on uh, molecular mechanics instead what I previously introduced on electron density. And here atoms have a point charges. They are, the bonds are for example represented by Spring potential, Van der Waals interaction, for example, by Leonard Jones potential. And we use such a method um, to explore, for example, conformational space. So conformational space of a molecule, it can be explored in a vacuum, but also we can explore it in, for example, different solvents. And um, another thing we have also is uh, lattice energy calculations. And, and as I will also demonstrate later, it's also, we can predict uh, the crystal shape. Crystal shape predictions we, we, quant, we found quite useful because for example, different polymorphs, usually they exhibit dif different crystal shape. And just uh, knowing what um, shape looks for different polymorphs, it's quite easy, for example, identify them by, by Microsoft. Our solvent workflow starts with a large high throughput computational screen. And usually we screen up to 70 solvents. So we identify the most suitable solvents in terms of solubility, so yield, and also exclude those solvents which show, for example, high propensity for unwanted hydrates or, and or solvates. 
starting from a set of 70 solvents, we identify typically eight, eight solvents, which we go forward to the experimental validation. So for the experimental validation, we usually do two-point solubility. And in this kind of experiment, so these experiments are done in crystal 16 usually. And here, we don't only look uh, for solubility, but also for potential uh, degradation. So for the purity, and as well, we always isolate the solids and we look for the form. Uh, so two-point solubility, it's, it's uh, two temperatures, low and high temperature. And after, after this, we are narrowing down even further. So usually to two or three solvents, which we then perform a small scale crystallization experiment. And this is usually done in crystalline. So here we are looking for metastable zone with form, purity, crystal shape, yield, and productivity. So just to give you maybe a bit more detail. Uh, so starting with the computational screen, so we select based on solubility and uh, solvent class, and uh, maybe a chance to, to form a propensity to, uh, of a solvent, we select eight solvents. Then we go forward with two-point solubility. And here, here I want to say, if the solubility data shows that it's possible to get the yield higher than 75%, in this case, we are proceeding with the uh, screening crystallizations, which are cooling cooling crystallization, and usually we do it unseeded. Why unseeded? Well, because we want to also in the same run, we want to see by slowly cooling it, what is the metastable zone width. After we cool it down, uh, we are keeping it at one temperature for aging, and, and then we isolate. So then we, want, we are looking what is the form we are isolating, and what is the purity of the solid and also of the mother liquor, and what is the morphology, and finally we, we want to confirm uh, the yield. Is it exactly what we are seeing with the uh, solubility? And after that, we select usually one option, which then goes for the process definition. The process definition, we usually go to the 100 mil or 400 mil automated reactors, which are fully equipped with, for example, particle track, so FPRM and also IR. So here we have a decision tree if, uh, from solubility data. If the yield is not possible to achieve just by one single solvent higher than 75%, so then there is no chance to go most probably for cooling crystallization, but we need to select um, an anti-solvent which will further improve the yield. So usually here we are limiting down to two dissolving solvents because coming into binary mixtures here, having additional sex anti-solvent, that of course increases the um, solvent which needs to be screened. But here I would like to emphasize, especially the computational screen is quite powerful because we can screen many conditions uh, before selecting only few interesting points where we, which we validate on the, with the experiment. So we select six anti-solvents from the previously done computational screen on neat solvents and anti-solvents. And usually the selection of seven uh, relevant anti-solvents is done by on miscibility. And also we want to select uh, green, green anti-solvents. Yeah. So once here we are creating the, um, so it's a, solubility as a function of solvent composition, starting from zero all the way to 50 weight percent or even to 100 weight percent. And, and here we are looking into the detail of how efficient is the anti-solvent. Is there any co-solvency effect or is, is there a solvation synergistic effect? So based on that, we are proceeding with the experimental so isothermal solubility, and here usually we pick up only few experimental points. If it, there is a synergistic maximum, we have experience usually it is around 50 weight percent. So this is what we want to check. Is it uh, really the synergistic ma maximum? We want to validate if the computational 
uh, screen is really predicting that synergistic maximum, that it's really happening. And in case there is a significant drop, so the anti solvent is quite sufficient, then we go, for example, to test at 50% is it really reducing the solubility drastically. So after that, we are selecting two solvents and we are going to screening crystallizations. Again, we are doing unseeded crystallization. This time it can be cooling, just first part, but then definitely we are adding anti-solvent. So f first we are adding anti-solvent. We can pull it down or we can just proceed with a simple precipitation uh, method. In this case, we are also noting how much time does it take that it nucleates, and we are also testing for form, morphology, and yield. And then we go to the process definition method. So here, here I also emphasize if the yield is higher, higher than 75%, but in case metastable zone width is poor, so it doesn't, we have a poor nucleator API. So then we are also considering to introduce the anti-solvent before, um, before it can be nucleated, nucleated and crystallized. Okay, so this is, I covered all uh, the workflow. So now I'm switching to the case studies. And our first case study is uh, an API. Um, and it's a really API with a very high melting point. So 215 centigrade. So here you can already see just by looking at the melting point that uh, the compound probably will be poorly soluble in most of the solvents since API is quite stable in crystal lattice and doesn't like to disintegrate, disintegrate and dissolve and uh, mix with the solvent. So, and before going to the solvent selection, I just want to briefly introduce you maybe to the background of the compound. So in this case, we have two polymorphs and they are enantiotropically related to each other. So the, the desired one is for one and that's the, um, the one which is the um, Janssen event for the commercial form. And it's only stable below 50 centigrade. When we got two forms here in APC, uh, we, per we per performed our DSC analysis as well as Raman. And in, we found out it can be clearly distinguished, not only by DSC and Raman, which I, it's always a benefit because uh, especially in early development, you can work with uh, smaller quantities. We also um, had an indication that it has a high solvent formation propensity. And in terms of particle attributes, there was no specific uh, requirement for uh, output particle size distribution, only that it filters well. And this is because there was a spray drying technology on the formulation. So in terms of purity, uh, there was a lot of problems there because first we developed the crystallization using the so it's um, pure material but then once we started to test our developed crystallization with the crude input material there was the crystallization didn't behave the same and also the crude materials there was a lot of variability and so there was already identified impurities but we also in APC identified that there are also some unidentified impurities. And I will tell this a bit more detailed later, where we actually managed to identify those impurities by, by Raman, just by looking at the fluorescence. So these were most probably uh, fluorescence impurities on the PPM levels. So he, here we performed the um, as I mentioned, the computational solvent screen. In this case, it was about 40 solvents. And um, and also we included exotic solvents, so high boilers like NMP, DMPU, TMI, NBP, just because we knew it probably won't dissolve in most of the solvents, which turns out to be the case. And um, in parallel with the solubility, we also performed the solvent formation propensity. So we calculated that the uh, enthalpy of mixing is highly negative for all those um, high boiler solvents. 
which is already was a red flag because it showed potentially yeah there will be problems with the uh, with solvate and once we performed our solubility data so th these are the solvents we, which we went from for just because uh, although we knew there will there might be a problem with uh, forming the solvate we didn't have more choices because all the rest solvents didn't give much solubility. And especially we, we, we couldn't afford to go to higher temperature because uh, we wanted to isolate the form one, which is stable only below uh, 50 degrees. So we didn't want to risk the formation of the undesired form. So here, doing the Solubility, experimental solubility. We can see that uh, the ranking order was was right. So this this we computed the solubility, relative solubility based on solvation-free energy. So we we did a non-interactive method. So by um, and and here the solvents are ranked, and the same order we can see in the um, with the experiment. In these cases where I don't have the values, it's either because the solubility was too high, or actually, in this case, was happening that uh, the solvate mass formed. So there was no mother liquid sample for solubility, which already proved to be problematic and probably showing to solvate formation. So all solids were analyzed by DSC and Raman, and here I'm showing Raman, which nicely confirmed actually that we are forming a solvate. So usually for solvate, there is a shift which we can also see here. In this case, it, there was also a doublet forming, but definitely just by looking in, Dahmer, uh, in the Raman, we didn't have the form one or form two, we had a, a new form, which just by looking in DSC, uh, we confirmed it's a, it's a solvate. So having all of this data together, we actually went for uh, the only solvent, which was the um, option, which is a THF, because it has a high solubility and it was giving the right form. So having a THF as a dissolving solvent, we definitely needed to find a, a proper anti-solvent so we can um, crystallize our material. And here we performed bi a binary mixture solvent screen anti solvent screen and we, we considered from water all the way to hepten and metal cyclohexane and toluene. And we found out that water gave a quite high synergistic effect, which was proven also by experiments. And and we also found out computationally with the red here curve that hepten is the most un efficient anti solvent which was first confirmed by only this point at uh, 58%. And then later when we identified our solvent system, so THF uh, heptane system, we also built it up the um, solubility curve. And just by looking in the solubility, 96% yield is achievable and also with a high throughput of 12 grams per 100 grams. So this was put forward to the process definition. And um, based on our solubility data, we, we designed our crystallization. So first, it's, we are starting, so it's, a, it's an isothermal antisolvent crystallization. But just to increase the throughput, we are actually dissolving our material to just below 50 degrees, cooling it down. Then we are adding antisolvent so making the uh, solution super saturated, we are seeding, and we can see from FBRM trends, um, there is a secondary nucleation, which equilibrates after the edging time. Also, IR shows that the that solution is nicely dead super saturated, and after that, we are adding the final dose of uh, an antisolvent, which uh, there was no secondary nucleation, unwanted secondary nucleation happening, which which uh, turns out to be a very nice uh, crystallization design. Yeah. So this was optimized and fully scaled up up to 12 liters. So this was done at our colleagues in CTU, 
and uh, during the scale up there there was a right form there was a good filterability and there was a low residual PHF content so a good good process I just want to highlight um, once we switched to crude material there was a problem here after the seeding so the material didn't want to nucleate or it nucleated a bit later and in only one case we found out that actually we 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 got the um, undesired form form two which was probably um induced by impurities so that that was uh, a problem and just by analyzing crude materials which we got here in apc we found out that uh, raman it's the baseline is quite flat for pure materials but when we got the first crude material it has a uh, fluorescence and two peaks which we calculated uh which correspond yeah we were, we were thinking maybe it might be even two two different impurities but we weren't sure but once our colleagues had sit in, in uh, Janssen they changed the crude step and they managed they said to remove the impurities so we got the another crude material which was performing better and after uh, recording the raman spectrum we actually found out it seems like that they managed to remove one impurity but that the one was still there and here i just wanted to highlight that the power of raman so it was able to detect fluorescent impurity which were not been able to detect by UPLC. so and the uh, quantities was uh, ppm level but it's interesting because even though it's a ppm level they they even even so low concentrations they've been able to affect uh, the crystallization so in terms of um, prolonging the nucleation time and even having troubles with um, generating the right form throughout the process so i'm switching now to the second study so the second case study was we have an api and the melting point was significantly lower so it's a 126 centigrade in this case we also got two forms form one and form three form one is the most stable and it was also clearly distinguishable by DSC and, and Raman. Regarding the purity, uh, API was unstable at elevated temperatures. And here the focus of the project was actually uh, in terms of solvent selection. We wanted to select a suitable solvent, which will be then, uh, we will use it so the, the solvent system can be used for further kinetic assessment for continuous crystallization. So it was a batch and uh, steady state operation where we wanted to assess is it APR suitable for MSNPR reaction. This work is done and presented in Orlando by Gladys, and I won't go into details, but I will I will show you how the solvent how the solvent was selected. So in this case, we started with uh, our computational work. And uh, because the melting point was quite low, um, and just looking into data, when we computed some of the data in comparison to some limited supply data, very crude experimented data, we found quite a good match. So we, we got confident, OK, let's go for this time for absolute values. So we were using melting point and enthalpy of fusion as a reference. And in our software, we were able this time to calculate absolute values, not only for room temperature, but also at 50 degrees. So in this case, we were selecting the solvent in silico. And our selection criteria was, OK, let's go for cooling crystallization. So this is always preferred. And let's find a solvent with high yield and throughput. And so we were looking at the room temperature solubility data. It's the is low that the slope of the solubility curve is high and, and then there is a high solubility at 50 degrees and in, we identified a number of solvents so isopropanol mek isopropyl acetate and anisole so this with this we went uh, further to the experimental validation 
And in this case, we were using isothermal slurry method. And uh, when, when we were isolating mother liquors and we were checking the purity, three solvents were ruled out because we found an impurity in those solvents at, at higher temperature. So then uh, just by analyzing the solubilities, we found out indeed that uh, isopropanol, anisole, and isopropyl acetase are, are good solvents. But out of those three potential solvents, actually isopropanol, we went for isopropanol just because the, um, there was a very high solubility at 48 degrees, which assured that we will have a high throughput as well as yield. So this solubility says is at room temperature, so 20 degrees. But we found out that even below 50, uh, if we lower down temperature to zero degree, we can get even higher yield. And with that, we went uh, still with keeping. So we selected isopropanol as a runner, but still we were keeping uh, additional two solvents just to check what is happening while we are crystallizing the, in all, all those three solvents. So here I am showing the crystalline, which we found we find it very useful for our skiing purposes when we do our proof of concept crystallization experiment. Especially when we use um, overhead steer, we can also look in the morphology. And and here I'm plotting the trends which crystalline is giving us. So it's the temperature and also turbidity. So we are we are first starting with uh, slow cooling, and we can observe where the compound is nucleating. So we are we are noting down metastable zone width, and after after that there is an aging period, and then we are cooling further to to 10 degrees, and then and then then again uh, waiting period, and then we isolate. Uh, yeah, I want to say here maybe for crystalline it's nice the camera, which is in, embedded in the crystalline. We can see the shape during the nucleation. Unfortunately, later, uh, it's not possible to see just because it's uh, too many particles there. But at the end, this is the microscope, which is um, the morphology analyzed by a microscope. Yeah. And we can see that the morphology is uh, rod-like. And also, we observed um, what is the concentration and what is the yield. So we got 88% yield for isopropanol. There is a... Form one, which is desired, and there is no impurities detected in the mother liquor. So when we presented this to Janssen, to client, this was perfect, nice, but but still um, having a yield of 88% is not ideal. So it, it's more desirable to, to increase the yield. So in this case, that's why we decided, okay, let's go and screen for uh, antisolvent, which can be added at the end of the cooling crystallization. So just to get a better yield. And we did first uh, computational screen. All of the antisolvents gave a bit of synergistic effect. So there was always um, um, not so efficient antisolvent at up to 30%, but then later uh, we were getting quite nice, especially for heptan. And this is the antisolvent we selected. And then we mapped not only at the different experiment and not only different um, solvent compositions, but also different temperatures. And here it was possible to increase the yield from 88% by adding antisolvent to 94%. The only maybe, let's say, downside was now that we are re reducing the throughput by half just because we need to add 58% of, of a heptan. And, and with this system, we went through the process definition. Even though we, we were already um, looking into the action times and metastable zone with at the crystalline scale, we are, we are always repeating this also at, uh, for example, 400 mil scale. It's maybe the best because those nucleation induction times are more reliable and representative of what will happen on the industrial scale. And just by noting what is the metal table zone width, so we, based on that, we designed 
we, we choose what is the ceiling point. So 30 degrees in this case. And after cooling down, there was unwanted uh, nucleation. And after cooling down, we were adding uh, heptane up to 50% just to get the yield. And I think this is uh, also very good um, run, which is, this is only a process definition assessment. So first, first run. And of course it can be still optimized, but, but it gave a high yield, no solvation, and the very high throughput and the particle morphology was acceptable. So now when I mentioned uh, crystal shape, I want to maybe more, go more detail about, about that. So the, we are using crystal shape prediction also here in APC. And this is, uh, crystal shape prediction is an active area of research. So different modeling approaches exist. So for example, evolving from uh, geometric, energetic, and also to the mechanistic, like spiral growth or Monte Carlo simulation. And here the prediction accuracy increases gradually as well as complexity. And what we found most useful and it's most widely used, it's an attachment energy method. So it belongs to the energetic um, me uh, method. And the reason why it's widely used is because it's um, simple calculations and relatively reliable accuracy. So it's quite valuable for screening purposes. So those methods, um, the, the morphology is built based on uh, calculation that the growth of a particular phases is proportional to the lattice and energy, actually energy of the slice. When, en when the slice is uh, put into the bulk crystal and the en that energy is released and it's, uh, it's done for a particular uh, crystal phases. So and the slowest growing phases becomes the morphology, morphologically the most important. So as we can see here on this slide, we have here predicted morphologies and they are very much in line with the experimental observed morphologies. So I want to emphasize, even though this model here doesn't consider the solvent environment, um, but it's still good and probably due to the fact that the shape in most cases is indeed predominantly controlled by internal interaction within the crystals rather than with the solvent environment. And this, I think we found in APC especially the case holds and it holds to for mole molecules which with dominant Van der Waals uh, forces. So those kind of models, once the shape model are generated, are quite useful because we can look into the surface chemistry of individual crystal phases and we can think about what solvent might be, for example, best if we have a needle-like shape. Maybe they can help to suppress of those fast-growing phases, for example. And this is an example where individual crystal phases were simulated. And in this case, it's in interaction with the solvent environment. And the shape is constructed, yes, again, based on the attachment energy but in this case it's attachment energy it's a modified attachment energy because we are also considering the solvent environment so we have here three different settings a vacuum where there is no external interactions on the left hand side then it's less polar environment in the middle and there is a more polar environment and we can see that the aspect ratio in this case is affected and that the polar solvent most probably is inhibiting the growth of fast growing phases. And this is, was also in agreement with the experiment. We can see here needles for less polar solvent and uh, quite um, so with the less aspect ratio and quite uh, compact crystals in the case of more solvent environment. So with this, I would like to summarize what I presented, so I hope you you were enjoying the presentation, and I hope I managed to demonstrate our workflows for um, early phase crystal crystallization development. So I presented 
one case study with isothermal anti-solvent crystallization and the other one with the cooling crystallization. And uh, so the, and I, I hope you got interested in the methodology which we are using for the solvent selection, so we are based, which we base on in silico predictive modeling and also followed by smart experimentation. And this is um, for smart experimentation, we are using parallel reactors, so crystal 16, crystalline. And I also hope I managed to demonstrate that also the Raman is quite useful for solvates and impurity in the identification, and as well as the form. And so in APC, our strategy utilizes advancing in thermodynamic modeling and to minimize development timeframes and also to maximize the value of the choice made in the early stage development. And we hope when we get the project in APC that uh, phase one crystallization can be successful right from the start all the way to the scale up and to the manufacturing as it was demonstrated during the talk. So thank you, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Marco. A good uh, presentation and all this information that you have shared with us and also to Janssen that uh, allowed you to present these uh, nice uh, case studies with us. Um, you have already um, shared with you your experience also with our Crystal 16 and Crystal 9 instruments. Can you share with us uh, any other applications? Because I'm pretty sure that you, you use these uh, instruments for uh, uh, with more applications in mind. Uh, is it anything that you can think about to share with our uh, um, viewers today? Uh, yes, so there, what, I've, what we found very useful, it's uh, not only for small scale crystallization experiments, but also very often we perform, for example, competitive slurry trials, and also to map up the thermodynamic phase diagrams, but also, uh, what I found very useful, crystalline especially, it's for um, kinetic, uh, to, to map up the kinetic phase diagrams. So these are usually experiments done in crystalline, where we seed usually a mix of the form. And then we just uh, want to see uh, what form will crystallize. So not, not wait for the thermodynamic equilibrium, but just to see what will crystallize after the seeding after, for example, after three hours. So this, this is what I found very useful. Also, it, as I mentioned, it's for solubility, for, for poly, polythermal solubility. So there is there is many uh, reasons why, why to go for crystalline. And, and maybe the most is uh, just because it's uh, on a small scale, so we don't need to use much material, but it's also quite um, handy and fast. So we can, for example, when we perform one run on uh, 100 mil, I think we can perform uh, much more runs on the crystalline, for example, three or four. So it's, it's just faster, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Marco. We have quite some questions, a lot of questions, and a lot of also uh, um, uh, ni good notes, nice notes. Uh, thank you, all of you, that you uh, you have uh, uh, experienced uh, uh, nicely. Uh, you found uh, this uh, presentation of Marco interesting. Um, I'm trying to uh, read now some of the questions. Uh, what, uh, one of the questions from Joe Gao. What is your assessment on accuracy from the solubility prediction versus any experimental results? Uh, what did you mention at the beginning? What is, I, I missed this part. What is, what is your assessment on accuracy uh -huh. from the solubility prediction versus the experimental? Okay, so that's a good question, yeah. Uh, we found sometimes works very, very well, especially if the melting point of the material, API is low. Um, we could probably look then at absolute values. In some cases, it works very well. Um, in some cases, there is a bit of drift, and especially if you go to high melting points, which is probably due to not considering the um, heat capacities, yeah. But, but in general, 
what I found actually uh, for screening purposes, it's not much a focus on the really absolute values. So we, we really use the tool to screen and to propose a suitable solvent that, which we can then really get the accurate value just by doing the experiment. So, yeah. I, I hope I answered. Yeah. yeah. A few of our um, uh, attendees, they are asking on the same topic, how long does it take to do the computational screening of 70 solvents? So the, the time consuming part is actually that uh, quantum mechanical calculations, which usually for the molecules takes about four, four hours or, or it, can, it can take longer. We had API molecules which took the, the whole night. <laughs> but this is just to build um, the, um, that quantum mechanical calculation. And then later actually, it's, the calculations are quite fast. So it can take 20 minutes to one hour. If, okay. if you do iterative approach, where you want to include also the concentration of, of API, I found out also when you calculate uh, high solubility that it can take a while just probably to uh, to converge. So I had cases which where it took half a day. Okay. Um, another question from uh, Marco, Ma but this time Marco from BI Sant'Agostino. Uh, he is asking you uh, which precision uh, in the computed solubility data do you usually get? Can you comment on charged molecules like salts? So salts are more difficult to predict the solubility, and but we we were modeling in some of the cases and it, it worked reasonably well but there was also some cases where it just didn't work much uh, so I, I can just comment yeah the salts are a bit more difficult and sometimes it can work yeah okay um, on slide 11, Nicolas Rim is asking, um, can you explain why Form 1 has two DSC peaks while Form 2 has one peak? Yes. Uh, so where did I say that? So here. No. On the 11. First. So yeah. the, um, the green one, it's that's the desired, I, I hope I'm not. Yes, that's the form one. And it has two peaks, yes, you're right. So first it melts, but then it recrystallizes to form two. Uh, so that means... And then it melts form two, most probably. Yes, but these are enantiotropically related. So it's a more complex. Oh, so okay. That means that the higher temperature actually form two becomes the most stable. And this can also be seen by the, just if you looked at the enthalpies, because the form one melts first, but it has a smaller, uh, lower enthalpy. And then, yeah, yeah, but definitely the, at higher temperatures, form two becomes more stable. That's why it converts into the form two, yes. Okay. Another question, how did you control polymorphism during crystallization in case study one? Once you dissolve the API, how did you manage to obtain form one and not form two? So in this case, we did competitive slurry trials just to make sure that it's uh, below 50 degrees and that the solvent composition, which we, we are working that we are always isolating form one. And all, all showed that we will isolate form one. And, and if you look here, if we are below 50 degrees, it seems like, yeah, it will be the case, which we, we, we confirmed, it, even though we already got that information from, from Janssen, we confirmed that by performing the competitive slurry trials. And uh, yeah, and, and throughout the crystallization, not only at the isolation point, but throughout only form one we were getting. 
Okay, there are a lot of questions. Uh, we, I will make them all available to to Marco, and uh, somewhere next week he will come back to all of you. Uh, I will take just one more um, question. Uh, well, actually, this is one more for <laughs> APC. Uh, very interesting, Marco. Do you do contract uh, crystallization research? I think uh, the answer is yes, definitely. Uh, you will uh, have uh, also the contacts of APC uh, shortly after this email, uh, after this uh, webinar. But one more question. Um, great presentation. Thank you. This is from uh, Edwin yes. Torres Cuevas. Yes? Can, can I just comment? Uh, thank, yes. Yeah, thank you for, for your comment. I just want to say maybe just a few weeks back, we we actually created a new website. So it's approcess.com. And please go there because the website is created for the process uh, scientists. There is a lot of resources there. So please visit. Great. Thank you for this. One more great presentation. Thank you. I have a question about the cosmoterm calculations. Earlier you said that because you got a good mesh, you were able to consider the DH results quantitatively accurate. What does a good mesh mean and how do you compare it uh, to a not good one? So as I said, for screening purpose, I think if we select the right solvent, <laughs> that's good enough. So the in, in silicon screening gave us isopropanol is the best. And then when we explored um, not only, so we explored number of uh, solvents and actually we got quite similar results. So there was a, there was a low uh, solubility at 20 degrees, but a very high solubility at 50 degrees. This was predicted by Cosmotherm and also confirmed by experimental results. So I think that's a good match. If, if you are asking me about the accuracy, yeah, usually if there is a bit of our experiences about uh, like maybe even 50, 100%, but I think this is still good enough for screening purposes. Okay, Marco. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, there are quite a lot of questions, a, good, uh, a lot of uh, good words for you. Thank you for making this uh, uh, presentation available and uh, share it uh, uh, with uh, so many people. Um, thank you all for attending. I will make this uh, um, recording available on our website this evening. It will be there, but most probably an email with the link to the recording you will receive somewhere next week on Monday. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, well, uh, we will also be able to uh, share the slides with you. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to uh, send us an email at info at crystallizationsystems.com or at APC, info at APprocess.com. Um, we, we will be happy to, to further uh, help you. Stay safe and healthy during these challenging times and hope to see you soon to uh, our next uh, webinar in November. Thank you all. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, APC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.